There are 10 things you need to know to be a woman. When you're young and the little boys say, let me see you pee, you need to say no. They want to see under your dress, bad things can happen. They come for you. When you're in school and the other girls laugh at you because you're dressed like a half wit, don't expect your mama to care. She'll laugh with her sisters, with her mother. They'll all laugh at you. They're laughing right now. They come for you. When you go breasts and the boys say they just want to look at them, they don't mean it. They mean they want you to undress. They mean they want to have sex with you and then with someone else and then with someone else and then with someone else. They will tell everyone how easily you slipped off your blouse, unhooked your bra, stepped out of your skirt. You thought it was love. They thought you were easy pickings. They come for you. In college, at the parties, if you have a drink and then another, his penis will slip inside you. And if you have had too many drinks, so many penises will slip inside you. It will be a party of penises inside you, a memory of penises, a throwdown of penises. And you will try to stand afterward. You will try to walk. You will hear them laughing. They come for you. You move to another state and start over. You date doctors and lawyers. You are taken to the country club where the fancy men put their hands on you. They take you to high-rise hotels where they grope you in exchange for dinner. You put out. You are popular. They come for you. You get a job. You ask the women at your company to help you. You want help meeting important people, making connections. The women will not help you with anything. They sew the scarlet A to your blouse. They come for you. You get married and then you get a divorce. You hope the women will invite you over to meet their single friends. They do not want you alone with their husbands. They don't trust you with their boyfriends. When you try to talk to their men, they come for you. The only way you could avoid attention is to get fat, but you live in a city where fat is not permitted. For a few years, you let yourself get a little bit fat and you have a few more friends. You have a fat boyfriend. Then you join a gym and lose weight. The women turn on you. They come for you. You could become religious, talk to God, become a Jesus lover or a God follower, and there in church, maybe the other women would like you. The other men would assume you aren't about sex. Don't people pretty much stop having sex once they join a church? You attend church one Sunday. Everyone can see that you are a fake. They come for you. You are a motherfucking skinny ass bitch. You stomped around the world in your life building castles. You've painted the sky and planted trees. You have broken the goddamn rules and when they wrote new ones, you broke those. You are out of control. You are the wild new testament of women. You are breaking the 11th commandment, which is thou shalt not speak if thou art a woman. You are speaking in your dirty boots without shame. Where is your shame, woman? Where is your shame? Why do you not hang your head, woman? They come for you. They come for you. They come for you. Oh my goodness, goodness. Thank you so much for being here, Kate. I remember the first time I heard drafts of that poem when you were reading at Beyond Baroque. It's so amazing. It's such a great way to start this text. <sighs> There's so many things that we can talk about here, but I think what I want to start out with is the organization. Why three parts? And most importantly, what you're doing with myth. Why Medusa? Why the Golden Lion? How is it functioning in the text? I, I got the idea of the before, during, after from a Richard Bausch book um, that had before, during, after. And I liked this idea of, of thinking about how we travel through time and space in our lives um, and how we're affected by shame. And I was very interested in um, the idea that both the, the, two, the twin pillars of Western civilization are, are Greek myth and the Judeo-Christian ethic. And both of them are very invested in the idea that women should be ashamed of th themselves. Mm -hmm. um, from the time we're born till the time we die, we should be ashamed. We should be ashamed of, of menstruating. We should be ashamed of being fat. We should be ashamed of our children whenever they do anything wrong. It, it's not like the dads should be ashamed, but we should be ashamed. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and we should just be ashamed of everything we do wrong, of desire, um, of, of, of everything. And um, so I felt that that shame, which was in both of those great mythic pillars of our culture, um, was what I wanted to dive into. And I'm someone um, who has worked in building literary culture. And that's a very difficult thing to do for a creative person. And it has, been, it has been very challenging. And so the Golden Lion represented the, my first idea of it, which was that it was going to bring me great joy 
and help me build something I'd never had, which was family. And, um, and in the end of it, the last Golden Lion poem is Golden Lion gets written out of this book. And it was, it was basically the idea was that that initial idea that building literary culture was going to bring me joy and family, I had to let go of. It wasn't going to. Mm -hmm. it, was, um, it, was going to, it was going to help a lot of other people, but it wasn't going to do anything for me. Um, so the initial thought that I had brought to the table, um, I, I did want to help a lot of other people, but I thought that it was going to be a two-way street in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, think, I think that a lot of people that start something like a theater or, um, you know, maybe maybe a, a dance group, um, or or maybe even start um, videotaping poets <laughs> might have that idea in the beginning. Um, but what they find out is that they're serving the community, and uh, that it's much more challenging than they thought. So then, what about the Medusa angle as well? Where does that come in? Uh, Medusa has been written about so many times, so much spilled ink. So how? does Medusa function for you in this text, and why do you espouse Medusa so much here? Well, you know, because of, of the, the, I was exploring this idea of shame, you know, who should be more ashamed of themselves than Medusa, right? Facts, facts. And so I started reading the text over again, and of course the text of Medusa that we all know the best is that she ends up in this cave and uh, she's being hunted down so that someone could get her her head and use it to kill the kraken. Um, but if you keep reading the text, what you find out is that the way she ended up in the cave with the head full of snakes was she was being punished. Mm -hmm. and she was being punished because she ended, she was in the temple um, and she was desired by Poseidon. He raped her. And as a punishment for being raped, she ended up in the cave of Sistine with the snakes. And once you hear that, you're like, whoa, mm -hmm. there's this whole other part of the story that we don't get told. Mm -hmm. And that felt to me like that's, that's how it works with women. You know, how did you end up here? Mm -hmm. How did you end up, how did you end up in this trailer park with curlers in your hair and eight children? Mm -hmm. And often that story is you, you dropped out of college because you were, you were raped by a frat boy mm -hmm. and then you didn't know how to find your way back into college. Your parents didn't want to talk with you about it. And so you married the first guy that came along and that's how you ended up here. How did you end up in this cave? Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's the, that's the big question with women is how did you end up here? And I felt like that backstory often just doesn't get told. But you do so really well in this text, especially with the poem, Those Who Love Medusa. Would you please read that? So this poem, um, you and I have both met the lovely Hila Plitman, yes. um, who, who sang this. Uh, so if any of you want to uh, look this up on YouTube, uh, Hila Plitman sings this magnificently. She has sung in some pretty good venues like Buckingham Palace. Uh, so she's, she's definitely worth listening to. Those Who Loved Medusa You, Poseidon, came to me in the temple. I laughed at suitors, men in love. You said I was a thing of beauty, a cup for love. You smashed the cup, you poured the wine. In Athena's temple, you raped me on the floor. My eyes met Athena's, she found me guilty. After the rape, I gathered myself in blood. Athena whispered, I curse you. Athena said, you wore red. Your skirts rustled, you smiled, your hair will rustle, your face will be unforgettable, your silky hair will be snakes, your voice a hiss, you are creature. Carry this story forward, rape is the fault of the victim. Carry this story forward, the female turns the key, opens the door. You raped me in the temple, I am that thing. Hold my head aloft, laugh for generations, don't stop laughing until Medusa is synonymous with death. Turn me into that thing you fear, make me monster, make me creature you fear in the dark. You fear the thing in the dark, wet, ripe, swollen, waiting for pleasure, that thing demanding. Fear the woman with her own snakes. Men kept visiting me in the cave on the island of Sistine. Men kept visiting the cave. 
It isn't true they all died. Imagine the men who entered the cave, found love in the dark. Imagine the men who braved the forest, found my lips. Imagine the men who found my lips. It is one of the kind of saddest things about how the patriarchy works on all of us, that so often women end up hurting other women when it comes to this and participating in the victim blaming. And for you to point that finger is just so intelligent and so potent. Another thing though, I kind of want to turn back to the golden lion because starting in section two of the book, they're kind of strewn and sprinkled throughout these golden lion sequences. So a little bit more about them and could you maybe read Golden Lion 1, Golden Lion 3? Does that sound good? Golden Lion has a ball. So it starts with a little introduction. We were all a Golden Lion once until the golden and the lion were stamped out. Before that, we knew how to write, draw, dance. Afterward, we marched in uniform. Golden Lion learns to be quiet inside house goes to school, shows off to other kids, makes a mess of desk, gets thrown out of classroom, laughs, copies in book, I will be a good golden lion a thousand times, picks wildflowers in orchard, does somersaults and jumping jacks, has a ball. Golden lion ball. Golden lions sometimes have too much fun and are therefore suspect. She looks like she's having a ball. Fuck her, fuck her and the horse she rode in on. At the Golden Lion Ball, everyone has a ball. Plays games after sunset, turns up the music, starts to dance, has a wild time. The moon comes up, arcing across the grass. Golden Lion starts to kiss, keeps kissing and dancing. <sighs> keeps kissing, keeps dancing. Could you connect the Medusa and the Golden Lion for us, for readers? Immediately I'm thinking, of course, about shame as you've been reinforcing, but also it feels though they both work in this kind of fabular fashion throughout the text. How does that work for you and come together in your head? To me, the Medusa who was in the temple um, is sort of the Golden Lion before the joy got got stamped out mm -hmm. um, and and t to me what I wanted to give Medusa the power to do and you could see by the end of the poem is reclaim her story and retell the story mm -hmm. so that she's you know in, in several of these poems I, I let her tell different versions of her own story in some she ends up with w a group of women at mm -hmm. the end of the story and in this one mm -hmm. she has all these male lovers you mm -hmm. know because basically Medusa didn't get to tell her own story um, and so to me that that golden lion joy that she would have had at the beginning of her life got stamped out and she ended up in the cave in the Greek myth, mm -hmm. and and I and I feel like um, she didn't get to reclaim her story in the Greek myth, but I wanted to give her a different, the power to, to to reclaim her story because I do think that as women, you know, we're not living in Anna Karenina. Mm -hmm. You know, we get to, we don't have to throw ourselves under the train. We we do get to reclaim our story and 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 tell a different story. And I know after Roe v. Wade, it, it feels dark in America to be a woman. And it also feels like there isn't as much of a sisterhood as there should be. Mm -hmm. I, I thought so much about Hester Prynne when I was working on this book. Oh, yeah. The women sewed that, that scarlet A on mm -hmm. Hester Prynne. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we don't support each other as much as we should. But I feel like, um, even after the golden line is stamped out of us, we can find a way to retell our story and make a new story and find a new narrative. You know, being culturally Catholic like I am, Catholic school all the way up through high school, um, I don't know if I'll uh, ever espouse Catholicism the same way because so much of it was about shame, which is what we've been talking about so much today. And a poem, particularly Eidos, really, really hits me for that theme. 
So this starts with a quote. For Greeks, eidos was a fear for oneself and one's place in the world if one did not act rightly. We have come to translate this word as shame. God watches you from heaven, sees the snail you squished, the fly you distributed across the wall. I act wisely. Do not kick dogs or punish horses, open doors, but God does not watch me. Not when stones pile up, not when the first stone hits, nor when I am surrounded, dragged from the village. What is God doing? Puffing air in the heavens while I feel shame for having brought the stones to my door. I said the words. I gathered derision, heaped stones in piles, invited the crowd. When they began to jostle, to throw rocks overhand, underhand, what could I say except, God, are you watching now? 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 That kind of gets us to the title, right? Mm -hmm. The Loneliest Girl. Who's watching out for this speaker? Mm -hmm. Who is? And can God see? And so, besides wanting you to read that poem, I'd like to hear why you want that to be the title. Why did you land there, The Loneliest Girl? The, the cover image is what brought Hilda Roz and I to this title. I, this book, I in its contract, is still called The Stoning Circle. Um, I love that title. I yes, love that title. Yes. Oh, so uh, Ilya Kaminsky worked with me on this um, for about a year with, with editing, and um, we thought of it as the book, uh, as the book The Stoning Circle. But it was hard to come up with a great cover image for a book called The Stoning Circle. Um, <laughs> and so eventually we found this, which obviously tied in with all the Medusa poems. Um, but then um, Hilda Roz um, felt that the, the title Loneliest Girl would work better with this. And so we ended up making the shift. And I went along with that. She was very generous to let me think about it for a week. Um, but it, it did feel like the narrator here was cornered in some way and couldn't find, was, was struggling to find a narrative mm -hmm. um, to, to rewrite her own narrative. And I feel like that's what being lonely is all about, is that you feel like you're alone in writing, rewriting your narrative. Um, I feel like, you know, like f my most important novel of all times is Beloved. And mm -hmm. at the end of Beloved, Setha has the, the, the collection of women to help her rewrite the narrative and to, and to exercise the ghost of slavery from her house. Mm -hmm. But she's lonely throughout the whole book because she's living alone with the ghost of slavery in her house and she can't get a man to stay with her because she has that ghost of slavery. And that that group of women, the community of women coming together with her at the end is what makes her not lonely anymore. Mm -hmm. This narrator throughout this story is lonely mm -hmm. um, and feels like they are, are um, cornered mm -hmm. in some way. The loneliest girl, she never. She eats apples with their cores sent to their room, spits out seeds, apple eater to your room. Other kids throw rocks. One birthday, a box of dirt, rocks, sticks. She thought a joke, hoped for a book at the bottom. Mean girls laughed as she searched through dirt for pages that were not there. She pulled her own hair just to feel. Out the window, the sun setting, days. She never. The other thing governing this text that we really haven't touched, of course, and you talked about a little bit, is religion and the speaker's time and being in a cult. And I think so many of the poems speak to that and clap back to that. But in your imagination, how does the speaker negotiate Western myth, the story of religion, and then their own personal story to find itself? How does that all work out for you? So while you were in Catholic school, <laughs> I, was, I was in a, a Christian religious cult. And um, so I, I learned cruelty early. Um, and so that whole idea of the, the group of people surrounding one, um, you know, as a stoning circle was something that I learned at, at, at the farm. And 
um, the kids um, giving you a quote gift that was just a box of dirt. It was just like, you know, kids doing cruel things to each other. And I guess kids do that anyway, but uh, it was a particularly kind of cruel place because everyone was cruel to, the adults were cruel to the kids. And uh, so the kids were cruel to each other. And when I left there, people would often say, did you have friends? And um, I mean, sort of, but because everyone was so mean to each other, it was hard to imagine having a, a, a friend. Mm. Um, so, um, so my experience of religion was that religion was about God wanting to be mean to people and throw them in hell. Um, and so I, I didn't think a whole lot of God <laughs> when I left there. I had a low opinion of God. And I have to say that even now, you know, w when I think about God, what's God doing about Memphis right now? Facts. Um, I, I'm not sure um, that God is intervening as much as uh, he or she, she could be. Um, so... Um, I think that um, my early experience of God was that God was uh, cruel and that the people taking care of us were cruel in the name of God. Almost like Poseidon. Mm -hmm. That's what gods do. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. Well, Kate, we went so many places a day, but honestly, every time I talk to you, I learn. Thank you so much for spending this time, and thank you so much for this text. I really feel as though this is the best thing you've ever written. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.